In high tides, for five weeks, Britain's been battered by extreme weather. Tonight, we look at the scale of the damage and try to count the cost. Tonight, we'll be live from the village that's become an island, its residents stranded for a week. It began with a tidal surge along the east coast, the highest for 60 years. We'll look back at more than a month of extreme weather. Christmas was cancelled for many. Strong winds left around a quarter of a million homes without power. This evening, 94 flood warnings are still in place, most of them in southern England. Some of the worst flooding is along the Thames from Oxford down to Surrey, where the water is still rising. We'll be finding out if Britain has the defences we need for the weeks and years ahead. And as the clear-up begins, just how much will it all cost? Good evening. Britain's just been through its stormiest December for at least 45 years. Wind speeds reached more than 100 miles an hour in some parts of the UK. Scotland had its wettest month on record. Tragically, it's claimed a number of lives. And tonight, in some places, the floodwaters are still rising. John Kay has been reporting on the floods and storms since the beginning of December. And he's in Somerset tonight in a village that is still completely cut off. Well, hi Sophie, good evening from Mochelney and if you're sitting at home tonight thinking the, the weather is past us, the worst of the storms are over, well lucky you because they don't feel that way here. This village is an island, look that's the main road, five feet of flood water, we had to come in by boat this afternoon, an alternative route for you, also completely blocked off. Now this is the Somerset levels, but this is just one community of many right across the UK still living with the consequences of all that weather. Let's have a look back now at a month of extremes. The battering began in early December, the biggest tidal surge in 60 years along Britain's east coast. In Scarborough, this van driver was lucky to escape. Some people lost everything. We stood by the patio doors here and we could actually see the kitchen fold. As the month went on, the storms hit more and more of the UK. It's been like this since first thing this morning here in the southwest of England. Not exactly a festive start to Christmas week. Here in Somerset, they were expecting Father Christmas but Mother Nature got here first. 50 something people are not going to be very happy and so I'm not happy. Hundreds of homes in many regions were flooded. A festive washout. Christmas is off for us. I was looking forward to it because I was having my sister over for this dinner. Now I've had to put her off because I can't cook anything for them. It's almost like the world is just coming in, coming in. It's so quick. Chris Rea never sang about this. As millions headed home, Britain's transport systems struggled to cope. And the roads are absolutely horrendous to travel on at the moment. We've been envying all those people that we've seen flying over us on uh, Heathrow, off to somewhere warm and sunny most probably. Or maybe not for those hoping to leave Gatwick, where power cuts meant cancellations, delays, and even police behind the check-in desks. We're trying to deal with this calmly. We know there are people that have been here over seven hours. Anyone racing for a train probably didn't need to hurry. 
I'm sorry to announce that the service has uh, been cancelled this evening. In Ayrshire, a white Christmas, but only due to the foamy sea. Some ferries kept running. Needs must. Didn't get very much sleep because we're worrying we wouldn't get home for Christmas. Power companies were criticised for failing to reconnect tens of thousands of people in time for Christmas Day. My main worry is, is the fridge at the moment because I've got uh, turkey which I bought. <laughs> in Surrey, the hoods had to spend Christmas by candlelight. I was going to cook and I can't because I'm electric so I don't know what I'm going to do. It went on for days, and on a trip to Kent, the Prime Minister was confronted by one angry resident. Street by street, things gradually returned to normal. And the government said next time Britain would be better prepared. We didn't need to wait long. The new year brought more of the same old weather, hitting Cornwall first. Look at that, <laughs> that's spectacular isn't it, absolutely fantastic. You can see the force of that water as it's coming over the shorefront here in our Drossen, breaking against the shorefront. <laughs> the Victorian promenade in Aberystwyth was hammered. This gym left full of rocks and seaweed. It's ruined everything. This is the second time it's happened now in the last three months. Mm. So, yeah, as you can see, the power of the sea is so strong. So many communities were affected, like County Down, hit by a triple whammy of blistering winds, exceptionally high tides, and yet more heavy rain. Inland, that rain has been falling on already saturated ground, leaving large areas underwater. On the Somerset levels, the village of Mutchelney is now cut off. We joined the rescue teams as they delivered supplies, dodging the dangers. That was a car. It shows you how deep the water is here. After the windiest December in 50 years, and the wettest in two decades, a dismal start to 2014. Now, it's the Thames that is causing most concern. Britain is soaking and just needs a break. Well, they certainly feel that they need a break here in Mutchelney, this new island community in Somerset. Join us a bit later when we're going to talk to some of the people who live here. We'll be asking them how they're going to cope, cut off, like this and asking them what they think could be done to prevent this happening again it happened last year as well so what do they think should happen in the meantime though back to you sophie on the mainland john thank you very much well here with me our weather presenter carol kirkwood and our science editor david Schumann. um carol we've seen some of the most extreme weather for something like half a century in places haven't we that's right and we expect storms in the winter sophie we expect low, low pressure areas to rattle across us but this has been exceptional. They've been rattling across the Atlantic at high speed. They've been very potent. And in a moment or two, I'm going to show you some satellite pictures which illustrate this quite nicely and also explain why it has happened. And David, they're talking about uh, defences there in Muchelny. You've been looking at how well Britain is protected. Yes, I took to the air by helicopter at the start of the week and saw what was literally an ocean of flood water covering the Severn Valley. The good news, though, was that most of the houses there seem to be kept dry. The flood defences there broadly seem to be working. I've also just been down to the Thames Barrier. They've been working around the clocks. So I've been seeing how they've been getting on. We'll hear about more of that in a moment. Well, hundreds of thousands of homes lost power over Christmas, including the village of Yolding in Kent, which was cut off for days. So what's it been like for the residents whose Christmas was effectively cancelled? Robert Hall is there now. Robert. 
So if the Yaldings are finished well used to floods and as you can see well prepared for those yet to come. But over Christmas sandbags would have done very little good in this part of the village. The water flowed in so fast from upstream that it would have been up to my neck or indeed even deeper than that. And all around me now darkened windows, the consequences of that deluge, that flood, people driven from their homes, others simply stripping their homes back to the brickwork. So bad is the damage and yet there is a but, a but which extends I suspect to many flood hit communities by learning to pull together. Villagers here have found resolve and a sense of purpose. Yolding on a crisp, dry winter's day. The three rivers which meet here are beautiful in summer but potentially lethal at times of flood. And this Christmas was worse than anyone can remember. A muddy torrent up to six feet deep surged down the main street, flooding through homes and businesses. The villagers could only retreat to their upper floors and wait for help to arrive. I went to see two people who became friends as a result of that day. Dave Jewson struggled out of his own flooded home to reach his canoe and his neighbours. I was paddling as, as well as I could and the eddy currents were dragging me into the vehicles themselves. You can't really appreciate it until you've tried yeah. to go through there before. David went past and we said, you know, we need to get out of here, can you come back and get us? To stabilise it, we actually wedged the canoe in the gate <laughs> to make it easier to get in because it's like, you know, you're in waist deep water trying to get in a canoe, it wasn't easy. So I think we'll kind of take a sort of holistic view of each room. Down the street, the insurance assessor had arrived to see June Chapman. June and her husband Tim run the village post office. Christmas is now a muddy tangle of furniture and ruined food. My best present was a tin of biscuits from one of the customers in the post office. That was, I can say, that was my best present for Christmas. Some days you're fine, other days just don't talk to anyone because you just bite their heads off. This is just so overwhelming. Nothing, nothing. There have been moments when anger and frustration boiled over, like the day when Erica Olivares confronted the Prime Minister outside her home. What happened? After he'd gone, did, did anything change? All of a sudden, it was like the village was alive. You know, the council were here with lorries, the, the um, environment agency was here, the fire brigade was here, you know, there was more help than we could actually believe. And yeah, obviously it had paid off, but why did I have to say that to get this work done? Small parcel first class recorded is back at the post office tim chapman and his customers will be sharing flood memories for a good while yet but villagers are also sharing their appreciation of the community spirit that's getting them through it <laughs> everybody in the village has been wonderful i mean more than wonderful i mean we wouldn't be we wouldn't have anywhere to live without anyone coming someone coming into the post office and say have our dad's flat I mean, the record effect of the law. Tonight in the village hall, the show is going on. Flood victims joining the cast of a brand new review to show that Yolding can rise above its problems. After everything I'd heard and seen, I wasn't surprised when they told me it had sold out. Robert Hall there in Kent. Now, Karen, you've been tracking these storms since that first tidal surge. That was December the 5th. And these storms, they have been relentless, haven't they? They certainly have, Sophie. And because they've been relentless, relentless, I can't speak, it has caused us all those problems. One after the other, they've come steadily across the Atlantic. If I show you the satellite picture, you'll see just what I mean. Low pressure after low pressure after low pressure has come our way and brought with it torrential rain and of course it's now falling on saturated ground there's nowhere for it to go we now need some dry weather for this to help the situation completely and the reason it's been driven over our way is because of a very strong jet stream now the jet stream is a ribbon of fast moving air which is up where planes fly basically and it's been moving particularly quickly picking up these areas of low pressure the stronger the jet stream the stronger the storm and basically chucking them out over the UK. So we're getting these very potent storms crossing our shores. Now you may wonder, well, why is the jet stream so potent? It's because of a thing called a thermal gradient. 
Now you can see in the charts there, we've got the blue at the top, that indicates it's cold, the milder air coming in from the bottom and the jet stream in the middle. That thermal gradient really feeds the jet stream. Now the jet stream normally travels at between 100 to 200 miles an hour, but in the last couple of weeks, at times, it's been travelling as much as 300 miles an hour. So you can see the kind of potency that these storms have, just wrecking havoc as they come across the British Isles. Is there more of this to come? Well, of course, we still are in winter, so we've still got a few months to come, and we can expect some more rain. But in the shorter term, we're looking at some more rain coming in from the west during the course of Sunday, and that's going to push steadily eastwards after that. And David, our science editor, I mean, you look at the impact it's all had, at least 2,000 homes flooded. I mean, that's not to mention businesses, farmland. Is Britain well enough protected? Well, it's obviously a nightmare for any victim of flooding. Over the years, I've been to places that have been flooded, and it's absolute disaster for those people. That The headline, though, is that broadly, the national picture is that the flood defence network has worked pretty well. But let's bear in mind that there's the rising river levels, and the threat does continue. The mighty gates of the Thames barrier facing waves of hostile weather. In the first eight days of the year, they guarded against rising waters 13 times. But at last, the rain seems to be over. Very much so. I mean, it's just been relentless. Andy Batchelor and his team have been on the alert for surges in flow that could threaten London and homes far upstream. A service tunnel runs beneath the barrier. The technology is from the 1960s, but it's proving invaluable decades later. The great pistons that closed the barriers did their job. I mean, how do you feel the country has done in terms of coping with this terrible weather? You can never plan and manage everything. I mean, we can only build to certain standards. The defences have performed really well. Um, some have been overtopped because this has been a major event. This is the most famous flood barrier in Britain with its vital role of defending the capital just up the river there. But it's part of a network of thousands of miles of flood defences around the coastline and beside the rivers. And what's unusual about the weather of the last few weeks is that all of those defences at roughly the same time have been put to the test. So as intense barrages of rain swept over the country, how did the defences cope? On Monday, I saw the ocean covering the Severn Valley. There are places where the defences have been overwhelmed, but what's remarkable is how many have done their job. But there's now so much water, the threat of further flooding isn't over. The River Thames here is carrying 400 tonnes of water every second. An Environment Agency team deploys a remotely controlled boat to measure the flood, a vital task. But this comes as people are asking if the government should be doing more. How do you look people in the eye who've been flooded and say we're doing the right thing? Well, what I say to people is, of course, to set out the fact that we're spending more money uh, than has been spent in the past. 2.3 billion that we're spending as a government, but bringing in 148 million of outside funding as well, so that more schemes can be funded. <laughs> New defences are being built, but the Environment Agency is also being cut. Flooding is handled separately in Scotland and Wales. The latest floods raise hard questions about what needs to be done. Now, looking ahead, David Cameron has been talking about how he very much suspects that climate change may be involved in this flooding incident. Actually, a lot of climate scientists are quite cautious about making that direct connection, but they do say that as the atmosphere gets warmer, it can hold more moisture and it has the potential to produce more violent extreme weather. Even if that isn't the case, as there are more and more people living in Britain, many of them in floodplains, in vulnerable areas, this whole question of how we defend people is going to become more and more important. And of course the Thames Barrier, you've visited, you've seen it too. It's, it's so busy at the moment. It's, it? it's an amazing feat. In fact, I was actually there on Tuesday. It was a busy morning for them. They had just opened the flood defences, but already at that stage they were preparing to close them later on in the day. Busy times. Very busy times. Carol, David, thank you very much.
Well, we have seen the impact the storms have had on people's lives, and these images show the impact that they've had on our landscape. This is Pom Pom Rock in Dorset, taken in December, and here it is last Monday. The stack has been washed away. This one in Cornwall shows Portreath Jetty with its tower clearly visible at the end. And here it is. Last week, the tower swept away by the sea. And this is the famous promenade in Aberystwyth. But after the battering it's taken by giant waves, much of it has been reduced to rubble. Well, Jeremy Cook has been looking at the clear-up. It was the perfect storm. A devastating combination of high water, high winds, and giant waves on a scale not seen here for decades. And in the firing line, Aberystwyth's historic, iconic promenade. In the face of all of this, sea defences crumbled. The road was ripped apart, leaving thousands of tons of beach gravel on what should have been dry land. Well, it's hard to imagine today the sheer power of all the elements that were at work here. First, there was the tidal surge, which brought water levels a good two metres above where they would normally be. And then there were the winds coming in from the southwest at 60 miles an hour and more, and at the perfect angle to cause maximum damage to the promenade. The seafront at Aberystwyth has had a tremendous buffeting and suffered thousands of pounds worth of damage. It's been a long time, but it has all happened before. 1938. A massive clean-up job then, with wheelbarrows and shovels and sweat. No flat caps today in this age of heavy machinery and high vis, but still a huge task just to clear the debris. Rebuilding will take months and potentially cost millions. The economy needs the funding to get it back on track. So whether it comes from Westminster, but from the Welsh whether government, it comes from Westminster, Brussels, Europe, we don't mind. We'll we'll take it from anywhere. But uh, there's there's no question that it's needed. Of course, it could have been much worse. No lives were lost, but it was close. Make no mistake, the storm here had potentially deadly force. <laughs> And so today, the people of Aberystwyth can concentrate on repairing their famous, iconic promenade. It's regarded as the tool in the ground. Peter Henley of the Civic Society, determined to stay positive. I like to think not in, in a way of despair, but we just have had stuff like this in the past, and we've overcome them. And I'm sure, with help, uh, that, that, that they will get back on their feet. All of this will be remembered here for generations. And while the talk of funding and budgets goes on, tomorrow morning the people of Aberystwyth are being asked to bring their shovels to the seafront, a united community response to the New Year's storm of 2014. So local people being asked to take wheelbarrows and shovels down there tomorrow to help dig out the promenade. And as communities work to get back on their feet, we've been trying to find out how much the storms could end up costing Britain. Well, Simon Gompertz is with me now. A lot, probably. Yes, well, insurance companies are counting the claims that have come in. There's still more to come. But an early estimate is that it will cost them £400 million. That's less than the big uh, floods of 2007, but it's still a substantial sum, and it includes paying for the 2,000 houses that have been flooded out, for drying them, for the repairs, for replacing the contents and putting people up when they can't stay in their house, and the average cost of doing that is £40,000 per home. In some cases, it'll go over £100,000. Quite a lot of people don't have full insurance, so they'll lose out. But even if you are fully covered, some people will find that you know their, the contents of their freezer isn't covered or their outbuildings, for instance. And there's the worry for many families that once this colossal claim goes through, then the monthly cost of their insurance is going to go up. 
And it's not just homes, is it? I mean, we've seen businesses and also huge swathes of farmland. Yeah, that's going to cost tens of millions of pounds to sort out. And for the insurance companies, they've already had 3,000 claims for farms. So that'll be for their buildings, for vehicles, for their livestock. But interestingly, not for their crops in the ground, because that generally isn't covered. So that's a worry for farmers. The other big cost is for councils. And councils tell me that the eventual cost of this is likely to be more than a hundred million pounds. So emergency help for people moving trees, repairing roads. A couple of examples. Cornwall says two million pounds already. Um, Surrey says five million pounds for the roads again. Um, just one thing worth mentioning as well. Those people in Yalding, those people who had their electricity cut off over Christmas and right across the south of England, tens of thousands of those are going to get compensation of up to £430 per household, depending on how long they were cut off. Simon, thank you very much. Well, let's go back now to Somerset and the village of Muchelnee, which is still cut off by the floodwaters after a week. And John Kay is there. John. Yeah, the sun might be shining in the painted ceiling in the village church, but uh, they haven't seen much sun here generally. In fact, the church has become a community centre, really, a hub over the course of the last few weeks where people can come because so many have been flooded out. Look, uh, here we go, some uh, groceries that have been brought in from a supermarket by boat so they can be picked up. Post that can be collected as well. But look, we've uh, gathered uh, some of the residents together tonight. Uh, some of them are flooded out and are living in farmhouses together at the moment. Uh, let's talk to Mr. Daniels to start with. You've lived here for, for 70 years or so. Uh, I mean, this part of the world is often flooded. But I mean, how does it compare this year, this time? Well, this is the worst, uh, worst time we've seen it for uh, the donkey church, really. And, uh, well, we, we just can't get out. We're just uh, frustrated, I suppose you could say. So if you need to leave the village, you'd have to go by boat at the moment. How yes. do you fancy that? Um, well, I can't walk very far, so that wouldn't help at all, really. Not for me, but it would help for a lot of the villagers. Does that worry you? Do you feel trapped? Uh, not really. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's not very nice, we put it that way. I bet it's not. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Still smiling tonight. Bridget, I mean, as I say, a lot of people will say this part of the world is traditionally flooded. Oh, it is, yes. But when we first moved here, that was 50 years ago, it flooded. It flooded within, we'd been here a fortnight and we had a flood and we couldn't get to Langport, but we got out the bottom way. And then gradually over the years, it began to get a little worse. Uh, we weren't bothered until they stopped doing the regular dredging and then it made a difference. And last year we were cut off from October the 21st, not completely round till mid-February, but on and off the rains lasted and the floods lasted and people couldn't get to work. And it's the people who have businesses. You speak to the people who have businesses. Let's, do that. Let's turn to Paul. Your, your business is flooded out. You're affected. I mean, what, what does this mean for you? We're a new business. We've been open for two years, and as Bridget said, it's a flood area. We accept that, but not to this level. Uh, we've flooded twice in two years. Massive loss of business. Um, big refurbishment plan. Um, not not good. Not good at all. What do you think could make a difference? Could anything make a difference, or is this just nature? There's no maintenance of the waterways. No, it's just just not happening. And uh, if the capacity of the rivers and waterways aren't can't hold the water, it's going to flood. It's going to flood our businesses and houses. So. See, more, more, more dredging. Let, let's just send a rod there in the middle. You, you, you're one of the people whose house is, is flooded. You're all living together at the moment. I mean, uh, for families, just explain to people sitting in their dry living rooms tonight, what does this mean? What's life like here right now? Well, it's not terminal. It's inconvenient. It's a disaster on a sort of social level. Um, all your things are upstairs. You can't get to anything. Um, you're living kind of as if you've gone on a two-week holiday to Thorny Farm Cottages up the road because that's all you can take with you. You can't get in and out unless uh, good people like Mike here take you out in the back of their tractor. So it's, it makes life very difficult. I can't believe how you're all still smiling. You've been so hospitable and welcoming to us. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, at the moment, they think that uh, the river levels might drop. They might get out of here uh, on road by maybe this time next week. But if there's more rain in the meantime, Sophie... This could go on for longer, as you hear it, uh, it went on for much longer last year. Back to you. John Kay and the residents of Muchelney, thank you all very much. Well, the extreme weather has affected almost every part of the United Kingdom, and it's not over yet. 
this weekend, flood waters continue to rise. You can, of course, keep up to date with BBC News, but that's it from us. We'll leave you with some more of the extraordinary images of the storms that have been battering Britain. Southeast veering southwest 7 to severe gale 9, occasionally storm 10. There are a number of severe flood warnings already in place. Another wild day out there with a very real risk of uh, further coastal flooding. Soul destroying is what it is. This is the third time it's happened now in a few years. Well, I've lived here all my life and I have never ever seen anything like this before. You panic, everybody panics. Because it's you can't stop water, you can't once it's flowing, you 